Okay, this video is from uh, chapter 11.1, .1, section two. Uh, you already have the notes on the, the, the bulk of this lesson. So I am going to start on slide number 118. Uh, what you're looking at right now is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel painted by Michelangelo Bonarote. <clears throat> Some of the things we had talked about, here's the God giving knowledge uh, to Adam and then the overall vastness uh, of the ceiling. Later on, as you remember, I told you that he was going to paint another painting uh, inside the Sistine Chapel. Uh, it's gonna be painted 30 years after his original work on the ceiling. It's called The Last Judgment. It's uh, very large, it's, it's over the altar. Uh, I had actually when I came into the Sistine, uh, I actually walked through that door right there and found a painting just there above my head. <clears throat> now, in uh, 1565, there's a kind of an uproar about nudity in religious art. So a lot of these paintings got painted over uh, or they had fig leaves drawn on them. Uh, statues had fig leaves created. The David in Florence had a fig leaf that was created. The Sistine uh, had an official painter, his name was uh, Daniele de Volterra. Uh, his nickname in Italian is Bracciatone, which means the britches maker. So he kind of painted pants on everybody. Now again, you know, I told you that uh, these, these artists, they can't help themselves. They've got to paint themselves into the painting. And if you look at this painting uh, of The Last Judgment, Michelangelo is actually right there. He is, uh, he has painted himself into the painting and we'll get into that here in just a second. If, if you look, there's a saint who had been skinned as part of his kind of gruesome death and Michelangelo kind of took it upon himself to draw himself into this particular setting here. Um, where he is that, that saint who's a, just basically a husk of what a human being would be. This is a later uh, Pieta. Remember Pieta just basically means Christ off the cross. There are dozens and dozens of these done by different artists. But if you look, it still has the, the same kind of strength that he sculpts with. If you look at the body of Christ, uh, and you know the, the hands of probably Joseph of Arimathea, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea would would be here, and then his mother Mary would be here. So if you look at the musculature, you see he still got it, but it's not as finished or polished as the the Pieta of Saint Peter's. Uh, it's um, more introspective. So the less beautiful it got, the older he got. So you kind of get a look at it there. It's got that non-finito look up on top of the statue. So another one is St. Matthew's. This is as you're walking in. One of the reasons the picture's kind of yellow is I don't let you use flash in here. So uh, this is a statue that was in that hallway in Florence where you walk through to see the David. People were walking by this. And that's so when I noticed I, that that is St. Matthew. It looks like he's literally struggling to step out of the stone. And here are some techniques uh, done. You can see the different type of chisels used to uh, kind of make the marble come to life. Now his largest project is going to be St. Peter's Basilica uh, and St. Peter's Square. So. The basilica is the chamber of a king. It's, it's theoretically where the bones of Peter um, are buried down there in a sub chamber. It's, it's the largest interior Christian church in the world. It'll hold 60,000 people. That's uh, very equivalent to the Superdome uh, and it, inside. I, I've been inside it. It is incredibly enormous. You can fit Notre Dame Cathedral down inside it. Supposed to be the tomb of St. Peter. It's actually his last project. 
Uh, he was working on a statue, but it was like right next to where he was uh, sleeping. But uh, St. Peter's Square here, yes, I know it's not square, it's, it's round, but uh, this area right here is kind of his project as well. The Sistine Chapel is actually right there. If, in the great scheme of things, it looks kind of insignificant uh, as to what's going on, but there's, uh, there's the chapel itself. Another Renaissance painter, a pretty successful one, a guy who does a lot of portrait painting is a man named Titian. Uh, Tizanio Vicelli, uh, known, as, known as Titian. He's a leader of the Venetian school. He's from Venice. <coughs> he's a very successful uh, portrait painter. Uh, he's extremely wealthy in his lifetime, which is kind of rare for these guys. Uh, Michelangelo did well, but it took him, you know, 80 years to do it. Uh, Titian's wealthy, uh, through most of his painting career. He paints the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. And now we're gonna get into the Northern Renaissance. Now the Italian Renaissance is about beauty, it's about um, tortured muscles, it, it, it's about you know the man at its perfection. But the farther you get away from Italy, the more realistic uh, that you're going to actually see paintings uh, become. And the first one is going to be a man named Jan Van Eck. Jan Van Eck is from the Flemish school. Uh, why he is wearing a red towel on his head, uh, uh, nobody really knows. Again, it's more along the lines of, you know, Dante Alighieri, which uh, I showed you an earlier picture of. I guess he thinks it's a throwback to the times of the Greeks. Uh, he is from uh, Bruges uh, in the Netherlands, a very wealthy, successful city. Uh, Van Eck's considered the best of the Northern European painters. He's also called the father of oil painting. Now, these guys have to create their own paint, so it's not like you can go down to Walmart and buy it. So uh, he's got to create his own paint. He's got to have his own colors. He's got to have different pigments. He's got to mix them correctly and then apply them correctly because oil painting is different than painting with tempera, which is different from painting with anything else. <coughs> One of his most famous paintings is called The Marriage of the Arnolfini. Now I'm going to post this again on PDF so you can take a nice long look at it. But um, when you take a look at this painting, several things jump to mind. Normally I I ask my classes, what do they see? And one of the first things they, they point out is that the woman's pregnant, uh, that their shoes are laying on the floor, there's a dog in the floor, there's oranges on the wind, uh, uh, windowsill, that these two people are not the most attractive people in the world, you know, that there's some sort of clock looking thing in the middle, and there's a chandelier uh, above their heads. Also that they're in a bedroom. Now this is a painting that's been kind of misinterpreted over the years. A lot of people thought he was a Jewish banker and that this was a kind of a wedding photo. Uh, a lot of people thought that maybe he was a, a Protestant finance guy and you know this was again uh, in celebration of his child about to be born. But they found a lot more information up about this painting and it's got some really in-depth symbolism. Now the people in it, I'm sorry, they're, they're not attractive, but uh, just kind of hang in there with me as I, as I walk you through this thing. So if you look, some of the, you know, the red circle and the, the X's and stuff like that. Um, so you see the chandelier, you see the clock looking thing, you see that maybe she's pregnant, you see the little dog down here. Uh, you got oranges on the windowsill, you got shoes down here, <coughs> and it's in the bedroom. Now that is kind of a carving of a little saint that has been put on the bed. That is the signature of the artist, and that is a set of prayer beads. Now when we get up close, that is, doesn't look like a clock, but it's actually a mirror. So you see, there's, there's Van Eck, 
that, that is his signature, dead in the middle. And then you see this kind of, you know, let's just back up a second. You see this kind of clock looking thing. When in reality, you see that is Jesus on the cross. And then you have some beads over here, which turn out to be prayer beads. So there's a lot of symbology going on here. And if you look, what you've got is, the stations of the cross. So in, in this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, you have the death and then the burial. And over here, the resurrection, Jesus going to trial, uh, Jesus being condemned, Jesus walking to Calvary, and Jesus on the cross. So these are called the stations of the cross, but the symbolism is this. These deal with death. This, this side deals with death. <clears throat> this side deals with life. And then you have the, the prayer beads right here. And then you have a picture of Van Eck. These guys can't help themselves. They've got to put themselves in the picture. And then you have the groom. And then you have the bride in the mirror from, from behind. And you kind of go, what's going on here? This is, is this a wedding picture? Is this a, a picture celebrating the birth of a child? Well, if you look how this thing is set up, let me redraw this for you. You have one candle lit on the side of the groom and no candles lit on the side of the bride. So if you see, there's, there's nothing lit here. And then you have this little saint right here. Now the symbolism is this. A lot of years they thought it was a wedding picture. But come to find out, it's a memorial picture. Everything on the side of the husband, everything on the side of the groom, the candle is lit. The candles are not lit. This, this little thing right here is actually the patron saint of mothers. And you have something going on here. So you have the symbolism for life and you have the symbolism for death. So if you go back, you have death here, life here. Husband's on this side, bride's on this side. What they feel happened is that this is a memorial picture done a couple of years after she died and that this uh, celebrates their marriage. If, if you look at the entire painting, take a little step back here. And if you look at all the symbolism, they're in their bedroom. So it's holy matrimony. So they, they're on holy ground, which means their shoes are off. And if you kind of look, this is split. If she had died, then all of the death symbols are on this, on this side, and all of the life symbols are on this side, including the dog and the oranges. Now, he's saying his prayers with the prayer beads. He has a candle lit for hope, but there's nothing here, and then there's the patron saint, and it, it works itself out to be a memorial painting and not a wedding portrait. So if you look at the symbols, you know, the oranges symbolize wealth. So he's a wealthy man. You can't have oranges uh, in northern Italy. I'm sorry, in uh, northern Europe. 
uh, in the wintertime unless you're rich. The shoes are um, part of the wedding ceremony. If you go into the bedroom, the bedroom is holy ground, holy matrimony, so you take your shoes off. And dogs usually symbolize loyalty in, in these paintings. So the overall look for this painting <clears throat> is a memorial painting. And come to find out she had died almost two years before this was painted. So it kind of changes some of the thought patterns that, that people have on paintings. Now, again, not the most attractive people in the world, but it's just loaded uh, with symbolism, and, and as a memorial painting, it, it's one of the best out there. Let's go to another uh, Northern Renaissance painter. His name is Albrecht Dürer, with the umlau over the U. Uh, Albrecht is called the Leonardo of the North. Uh, he's German. He's also an engraver. You know, when you paint, you can only make money from the original painting. But these guys figured out that if you can engrave your painting into a sheet of metal and then print it, uh, you can make a lot more money by printing kind of copies of your original artwork. Uh, Drew was the first to sign his works. He does a lot of landscapes and, and he's realistic over beauty. This is a self-portrait. Uh, not. Not the greatest looking guy in the world. This is, you know, this is not the David. This is not the Moses uh, of, you know, Michelangelo. This is another painting by Dürer. And if you're wondering what it is, yeah, he's kind of got himself uh, dressed up there like uh, Jesus. Dürer paints another very famous man. This guy's name is Frederick the Wise. Uh, Frederick will come into play later on when we talk about the Reformation and guys like Martin Luther. Uh, Frederick will protect uh, Martin Luther. This guy is a German prince. Uh, this painting, he's a pretty young man. Now, one of the more famous paintings that he has done is called uh, Night, Death, and the Devil. Uh, a lot of these paintings will be on this art test that uh, I'm going to give you uh, later on. It's an engraving. So you have, you know, here's Zero's signature down here. Here's a skull. Uh, Behold death. He rides a pale horse. Uh, trying to, a knight trying to get reach the castle on a hill. Then you have another German painter named Hans Holbein. Hans Holbein the Younger. <clears throat> He's an artist and a printmaker. He does religious art, he does satire, but he also does art for the Reformation. Now, when they reform the church, when they convert from uh, the Catholic Church to the Protestant faith, uh, painting and uh, satire are going to be part of it. Uh, Holbein paints uh, for Henry VIII of England. This is one of his famous paintings. It's called The Ambassadors. You have two brothers here. One is a one is a priest, one is a Protestant uh, priest, and the other one is an ambassador to a European court. And what they've done is they've gathered up all their stuff that uh, kind of makes them Renaissance men. So they're musicians and math and science and all the things that, that are gathered there. And if you take a look, there's a ton of symbolism uh, in this as well. So they have navigation and measuring instruments here. Have a globe of the world. There's a Protestant songbook, a Lutheran songbook. You have a math book to tell everybody how smart they are. A musician. They have several musical instruments here. Oh, you didn't see the skull? Well, let me let me flip back. See it now? It's kind of an optical illusion that he put in the painting. And if you're not really looking for it, it it's, you kind of glance over the top of it. This man is called Peter Bruegel. Uh, Bruegel is Flemish. 
He's from Northern Europe. He paints uh, peasants. He paints landscapes. He's not, uh, he doesn't paint a lot of famous people. Uh, he's incredibly talented. His paint, uh, paintings are a little bit busy. Uh, here's one. It's called A Battle Between Carnival and Lent. So I don't even know where to look in this painting. So this is, this is Carnival right here. This, is, this man has got a stick through a pig uh, riding a beer barrel while eating a pork pie. And uh, th then you have Lent. Here's a priest who's skinny with a beehive on his head. There's just so much stuff going on here. You have nuns coming out of, of the church. You have a play going on. So it's just kind of like uh, Mardi Gras uh, gone berserk. So if you look, you know, you have a riding a beer barrel with a pork chop. He's got a meat pie on his head. Uh, they think he's a butcher. He's dressed in yellow. Yellow means deceit. No. So you, you got a lot of stuff going on here. So there he is. Got bones in the streets and playing cards in the streets. On the other half, you have the, the Linton part, uh, the, the church part. So here's the priest. Why he's wearing a beehive, uh, nobody really knows. So he has, it must be Ash Wednesday because he has an ash dot in his forehead. And then you have pretzels, which are considered part of a, kind of a prayer for children. There's a landscape by Bruegel called Haymaking. This one's kind of self-explanatory. When it's time to make hay, everybody goes into the fields and collects the hay because animals are so important uh, in this time period. But it's a pretty painting. I, I really like it. And he has something called a corn harvest. Now, in America, we go, that's not corn, that's wheat. But you got to remember that the word corn comes from the word grit. And when the explorers got into the New World and found the Aztecs growing corn, they didn't know what it was. It was called maize in the New World. But they just gave it the name that the Europeans used for grain, which was corn. So corn is generic. So it means the grain harvest. And you see these kind of things that I've got it circled here. This is called a wheat shock. And it's a way to kind of gather up the wheat to keep the, the good part from falling on the ground, but yet to keep it all together to be transported and used. Uh, I think Wichita State University is called the wheat shockers. And this is called a peasant's wedding. So if you look at it, this is, these are, this is a wedding of, of poor people. And if you look at the painting, you, you kind of look around and you go, okay, who's who? Well, the bride, she's right here. Can you kind of pick her out? And there's wheat shocks up here, so it's after the harvest. Now they're passing out soup and, and bread. They think this might be the groom. But here's a priest. Here's the local nobleman right here. So you see how I got all these things circled? There's a dog under the table. It's a very busy painting, but nobody in it is famous. So the bride's under the canopy. Again, I'm going to post this on the PDF files if you want to take a longer look at it. There's the bride. That's a door. They've taken the door down and use it as a serving tray. So there's, there's the priest and there's the, the rich man of the town. And that's it.